Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist and the Voice of Compliance, and I'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Everything Compliance. Everything Compliance is the only roundtable podcast in compliance with five of the top compliance commentators. The Everything Compliance gang includes Mike Volkoff, founder of the Volkoff Law Group, Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, the founder and publisher of Radical Compliance, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors with Affiliated Monitors, Sarah Haddon, the publisher and owner of Corporate Compliance Insights, and Jonathan Armstrong, partner at Quartery Compliance in London. In each episode, we take a look at various topics of interest in the compliance arena. We also have shouts and rants at the end of each episode. I know you will enjoy it. In this episode, Mike Volkoff takes a deep dive into the debate on whether a chief compliance officer should report to the general counsel or not. Volkoff shouts out to Harvard Law Professor Matthew Stevenson for his blog post, If You Don't Think Conflicts of Interest Matter, Consider the Kurds. Jay Rosen discusses the role ethics and compliance plays in mergers and acquisition process. He shouts out to General Jim Mattis and his remarks at the Alfred Smith dinner. Sarah Haddon takes things in a different direction by reviewing the ebook Trump and Compliance, which was published in late 2016 by CCI and was based on the Everything Compliance Gang's predictions of how compliance would fare under the Trump administration. Haddon shouts out to the new section of CCI, which will focus on persons early in their compliance career. Matt Kelly provides breaking news on discussing the SEC's proposed changes to its whistleblower program, and he shouts out to Boston Celtic Inez Camper Cantor for calling out the NBA on its hypocrisy around China. Jonathan Armstrong discusses the growing tide of U.S. style class actions coming to the EU and UK around the issue of data breaches under GDPR. I think you'll find this episode a lot of fun. We have a lot of resources we've linked to in the show notes, so check out the show notes because there's some great articles that each one of the commentators wrote about and or referenced in their remarks. Thanks again for listening. I hope you'll join us again for Everything Compliance. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode of Everything Compliance. And we have a full gang today. Jonathan Armstrong, partner at Quartery Compliance. Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, founder and editor of Radical Compliance. Mike Volkoff, founder of the Volkoff Law Group. Sarah Haddon, owner and publisher of Corporate Compliance Insights. And Mr. Monitor, yes, Jay Rosen himself from sunny Southern California. We've got a potpourri of topics today, and we've got a lot to discuss, so we're going to jump right in it with Jonathan Armstrong from the United Kingdom. What's on your mind, Jonathan? Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, Cornwall in the UK, and I'm sitting more or less on top of the transatlantic cable that enables us to communicate uh, across the Atlantic, uh, or at least in the olden days it did before uh, satellite carried uh, some of that traffic. And so I'm picking a transatlantic topic in some respects, that of class actions. So um, class actions obviously is something that we over here in Europe like to regard as a US uh, import to some extent. And I think many in Europe have tried to resist any form of class action for many years because we've seen the harm it seems to have caused in the US. But I think certainly in the arena of uh, data protection and data breach, the tide has become irresistible. And we've had some cases this year, I think, that are, that are stretching that envelope, particularly in the UK. Um, so we have had some litigation from Max Schrems as part of this whole safe harbor case against Facebook. And that that bounces between uh, courts in Europe from time to time. In terms of venue, it's been slightly unhelpful, at least to the uh, claimants. But I think we are getting the stage where we're seeing that, uh, as I say, that the, the tide is turning in favor of class actions. It's important to remember that the class action regime 
isn't the same across Europe. So different countries have different rules. And in the UK, as I say, we've had quite a lot of litigation recently. One of the cases I think we've talked about back in the day is an unfortunate case involving Morrison's, a retailer. And that case is about to come back round again, I think. The uh, court have established that in general terms, a corporation can be held liable for its employees, even when those employees uh, create or or commit a a criminal act. So that's uh, interesting litigation, I think. And when you know that the employer can be responsible for the acts of its employees, as I say, even when they commit a criminal act, then it's clear that the courts are somewhat extending liability on corporations. And they do that in part because they've said that corporations can more readily insure their risk than uh, than individuals can, for example. And that seems to me to be only a short-term reason because obviously insurance policies are frequently available when insurers aren't paying out. But once they start to pay out, then surprise, surprise, insurance becomes less available or at a higher premium. And in some respects, the uh, courts are also looking at following the money with another case that we've had at the start of this month against Google. So this case involved what's called the Safari workaround. So Safari is obviously the uh, Apple operating system. And Google used some technology to extract data from iPhone users, which they then sold. And uh, a guy called Richard Lloyd tried to bring a representative action, (coughs) which was dismissed by the original court and has then been granted. That's been overturned on appeal this month. Now, this isn't the end of the case, but according to... Uh, Lloyd and his counsel, this case could involve 5.4 million people. So very, very roughly about one in 10 people in the UK. And that could bring damages of between one and three billion pounds. So to say that this is the first action, it's also uh, uh, quite significant. And it's attracted some funding from uh, one firm of litigation funders that are involved, it seems, in quite a few of these type of actions now. And then the third case that we've had uh, 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 in court this month as well uh, regards uh, the British Airways data breach. And some of you might remember, again, we talked about this on these podcasts, the UK regulator announced in January that she intended to fine British Airways uh, £183 million. Now, I'm talking to you at the same time as the Brexit negotiations are going on. Let's not talk about Brexit. I'll only mention that, obviously, the exchange rate is volatile. So at the time you listen to this, that £183 million is either $183 million or uh, or or $3, depending on uh, whether Boris pulls the deal off or not. But the the fine itself is significant. And in addition, the court have allowed to proceed a collective action on behalf of those that are affected. And that might be around about half a million people there as well. So we've gone from the stage, I think, even in the last two or three years, when the defences were down against class actions coming over to the UK to us being almost all in with perhaps um, three or four uh, or five or eight million people potentially participating in class actions after data breach and data protection. And I think in some respects that gives the lie to people who say, oh, GDPR, has it really been enforced? Well, yes, it has been enforced. We've always said that fines are only part of the story. We've probably had about 2,500 fines across Europe for data breach. But I think these cases tell us that those affected by a data breach or data protection infringement 
will certainly have a role to play in the uh, consequences for any organization that loses data. Jonathan, do you see the English bar that you are a part of really lining up to lead this effort, or are transplanted Americans coming over and trying to uh, to impose a, more of a U.S. regime on this, uh, or will it be homegrown? Yeah, a bit of both, I think. There are certainly some U.S. corporations coming over here um, with, I think, mixed quality. Uh, I looked at the website of one, for example, uh, just to see how progress was being made on one piece of their litigation. And their FAQs on their website had all sorts of typos in them and talked about a completely different uh, potential action against um, Cathay Pacific, as it happens, which also illustrates the fact that that, uh, that Asian companies are, are also under the spotlight. So, um, so, so it's a mix of both. I think we've seen... Um, Lawyers that have more commonly brought personal injury claims trying to bring um, uh, uh, proceedings, but also we're seeing U.S. lawyers either get on a plane or a a ship and coming over here and trying to teach the uh, English bar uh, what they know about, uh, about bringing these representative actions as well. Well, Jonathan, I will volunteer to get on the QE2 and come over to <laughs> I'm not sure I can do part two on the training. But um, um, so, uh, Matt Kelly, let's go across the Atlantic. What is on your mind? Well, Tom, we have some uh, breaking news near and dear to compliance officers' hearts today. Uh, so the SEC has just announced that it will have a meeting on October 23rd to uh, discuss and presumably have a vote on reforms to its whistleblower awards program. Uh, This is a long time coming, and just to give you a sense of how long, the SEC actually first proposed its uh, uh, amendments to its whistleblower program back in the mid-year of 2018. The comment period on what these reforms were, that closed one year ago. Ago and now here we are finally um, what 13 months after the comment period closed, they are now going to put forward some revised rules and have a vote on them. I suspect. What are those revised rules going to say? We're not entirely sure, but here's probably the highlights based on the original proposed reforms in 2018: um, a cap on large whistleblower awards at 30 million dollars. Um, expanding more discretion for the SEC to give larger small awards. Uh, By that, I mean um, if you are reporting a relatively small fraud uh, to the SEC, well, if you only get 10 to 30 percent of that take home from the SEC from that settlement, if it's only for a few million dollars, that might not actually be a lot of money for a whistleblower. So the SEC is also wanting to give itself more discretion to give larger awards at the small end of the scale. Um, There are some rumors running around that they are going to now require all whistleblower tips to be submitted in writing. Technically, that is correct, but really what that means is just they have um, streamlined the intake, so you have to submit your tips by email. There is a certain form you have to fill out. Um, Anybody who thinks you're going to have to write it out in longhand and put it in triplicate, that's not what this means. But the SEC has seen a dramatic increase year over year in whistleblower tips. So it needs some way to triage all these things. So that's uh, another reform. Um, And then they are going to tighten up the rules for submitting a whistleblower tip based on independent analysis rather than you being an insider at a company committing fraud and you are giving the SEC um, inside information to help them unravel misconduct. So that rule would be more for like the Harry Markopoulos's of the world. He was the one who figured out Bernie Madoff was a fraudster. And there are outfits out there that are, you know, venture backed and they look at companies' filings to see if they can figure out a fraud. And you complain to the SEC and then you collect the award. Um, the SEC wants to tighten eligibility for those sorts of reports. And then lastly, uh, they are going to try to accelerate the dismissal of whistleblower tips that are not actually tips. Um, 
So I also think that is probably a good idea because there have been plenty of complaints that you might submit a tip and then never hear any sense of is it, where is it going, what's happened to it. Um, or if you are eligible for a award, it might be years before the SEC tells you you're actually going. To. Most of these reforms, in my opinion, I think are good because they are simplifying and streamlining how whistleblowers get information to the SEC. All of that, good. Uh, more discretion to give people reporting small frauds a more generous award. Good. This bit about the cap on large awards, on the other hand, um, a lot of uh, whistleblower activists out there are not a fan of this. Um, at the time these proposals were first floated in 2018, uh, the SEC's Democratic commissioners pretty much said they didn't think that that sort of reform was permissible under the Dodd-Frank law. Um, I read that as the Democratic minority saying to outside groups, when we finally vote on these reforms, please sue us, which, of course, Republicans sued the SEC when it was under Democratic uh, administration in the Obama administration. The Republicans in the U.S. chamber sued them all the time for various reforms. Now I think we're going to see the shoe on the other foot. Um, I have also heard from other whistleblower uh, activists, lawyer groups and whatnot uh, more recently that this is exactly what they plan to do that uh, the SEC is probably going to force this through. I will be very curious to see if uh, the SEC's economic analysis and the cost benefit analysis of this, um, if that, you know, what that says, because there are a lot of rule changes the SEC is floating these days that seem to focus more on the burdens for companies than the potential rewards for other people. Um, and I don't mean rewards as in cash rewards for whistleblowers, you know, the all sorts of investor protections and whatnot. Um, but a lot of critics now are saying that the SEC's cost benefit analyses of its rule reforms are flawed or incomplete or skewed. And then they haul the SEC into court under the Administrative Procedures Act. I've had at least two different people say, yep, we're ready to do that next week when they push this through. My other last comment about the whistleblower reforms is I'm actually curious if this meeting on October 23rd is going to happen at all, because the other thing that Jay Clayton has done as uh, chairman of the SEC is that he has announced meetings on contentious subjects and then canceled the meetings and just announced that the SEC had a vote. And these are the rules. And here's our press release. And peace out. Uh, they did that with uh, gutting the Volcker rule. Uh, they did that with a different series of rules to um, rescind disclosures that smaller companies have to make, uh, regardless of whether gutting the Volcker rule or reduced disclosures are good, bad, or otherwise. The idea of announcing you're going to have a meeting on a contentious subject and then doing this artful dodge where you don't actually have the meeting and it's just a bunch of statements that commissioners have because they don't really like each other and you know you avoid the public contention and you just put the new rules out there um that's a little i don't know i can't say i like it but i would not be surprised if this meeting does not actually happen and then we just see these new reforms adopted uh, as gospel and then hauled into court sometime shortly thereafter um Take that as you will, ethics and compliance officers. And, you know, in fairness, a bunch of compliance officers in the corporate realm tell me that actually SEC whistleblower awards are not often a temptation or a rival outlet that they worry about, as opposed to internal reporting to the compliance officer. Um, there is also legislation floating around in Congress that I think will be passed sometime soon that will extend whistleblower protections under the Dodd-Frank Act to internal reporters uh, who don't go to the SEC first. Remember, there was that wackadoo uh, Supreme Court decision last year that you have to file with the SEC first if you want whistleblower protections. That is does nobody any favors. Um, I think that glitch in whistleblower law is soon going to be fixed anyways. But we've got a lot going on in whistleblower awards and protections and corporate ethics and compliance officers will want to keep Watch on this closely. So that's what's going on. Does these uh, putative or purported reforms do anything to address the withering criticism 
the commission has received on the length of time it takes for them to make a decision regarding a whistleblower award? Well, we don't know yet because what was originally proposed, what, 18 months ago and what might actually be adopted next week could be different. Um, But what the original proposals were more about was how do we accelerate the dispensation of incoming reports that serve no use to the SEC and therefore they're not going to be a valid claim no matter what. Um, Maybe they're reporting on something that the SEC is already investigating. Maybe they're reporting something that is not actually misconduct, but, you know, getting them out of the system. That's not the same as somebody who does have a valid uh, tip and, you know, does lead to an investigation. And now you might be subject to getting an award, but you're not going to hear about it for four years or two years or whatever. There's been litigation over that um, where basically people are asking federal judges to tell the SEC, would you please hurry up and make a decision for this whistleblower what his award is? Those sorts of complaints came about after these initial proposals. So I, we don't know yet if that question is going to be addressed in these new proposals. I would also say from the compliance officer's perspective, the proper question here is who cares? Because ethics and compliance officers are foremost interested in getting internal reports to people who will care about them and do something about them and protecting the whistleblower. That is not the same as getting a report, protecting the whistleblower, and giving him or her a dollop of money as part of a regulatory settlement later. That is not a ethics and compliance officer's problem to solve. But we may or may not see some attention to that issue in whatever gets unveiled and voted on uh, on the 23rd. We'll see. Michael Volkoff, what is on your mind? Jeff Kaplan and uh, wrote an article for uh, Compliance Week Uh, And his point was why CCOs should or should not report to the general counsel. Uh, In fairness, our firm did a counterpoint to his article uh, written by Matt Stankiewicz from uh, my firm in terms of the importance of CCOs not reporting to the general counsel and having their own sort of independent authority. Um, And I thought it was interesting, and I thought uh, if anybody had any ideas on this or what, but uh, Jeff's article was interesting in the sense that this has been a controversial issue for, I would say, the last 20 years, starting from the 1990s, uh, when healthcare uh, enforcement agencies uh, were imposing requirements that uh, CCOs have an independent Uh, operation from the general counsel's or from the legal counsel's office. Jeff listed several issues, which are several reasons for this. He said uh, as to why his position is sort of retreated in this area. Uh, He said first that general counsels have a broader and deeper understanding of what a chief uh, compliance officer will do than is the case with others in the C-suite. And then he thinks, therefore, general counsels will be better supervisors. Second, he said that having the chief compliance officer report to the GC uh, can help in terms of getting more resources to the compliance program because the general counsel's budget is likely to be seen as more important than the chief compliance officers. Third, that the, in other words, The notion of reach is what he talked about, meaning how far and deep the compliance and ethics program extends. Uh, And he thinks that legal departments have better uh, presence in the business uh, and therefore have a seat at the business table and therefore can bring compliance and ethics into the business better than if you have a standalone uh, CCO or compliance office. Fourth, he argues that uh, general counsels generally have more clout within the organization uh, and therefore would have more influence than a general, than a uh, chief compliance officer. And finally, um, you know, he says, look, even if they're not reporting generally, if they're not reporting directly to the CEO, a chief compliance officer can always meet periodically in executive session without the general counsel with the audit committee. 
So this was his argument. I uh, I thought this was kind of feel like in some respects he did not sort of take account for some of the situations where we've seen where this has turned into a disaster. So let me give you an example. In the case of GM, we had a uh, you know very sort of weak compliance function that was part of the uh, general counsel's office and it didn't seem to do very well. We've seen other companies where compliance officers are sort of kept down in the basement uh, under the general counsel's supervision just because they viewed them as a threat. Um, And I think the article fails to, to reflect the difference between what a chief compliance officer does and what a general counsel does in an organization. Um, when we rely upon general counsels to be sort of the conscience or the ethical ambassador or the ethical representative of the company, um, I think we uh, lose a valuable voice. Um, and, uh, and I think when we lose that voice, um, there tends to be less attention paid to ethics and compliance. I also think that it, the article sort of does not reflect the reality, which is that most right now, at least the last survey I saw, that most compliance officers or chief compliance officers are reporting directly on a day-to-day basis to the CEO of the company. And to me, I can't think of having better stature within an organization than having a direct reporting relationship with the chief executive officer. So I kind of wonder where uh, Jeff was coming from on this, but I throw the, the his ideas out just to sort of see if anyone has any uh, reaction. I have a reaction to this. I mean, the best you could say is that Jeff's arguments, I think they make a lot of sense for companies that don't care all that much about compliance. If that is the situation, I would say you probably have deeper issues that are going to challenge the firm. Like, look, you're right. You know, the general counsel gets more budget. He or she gets more respect. They get invited to more meetings. They get listened to more often because they can tie people up into worse knots. But that is um, not necessarily synonymous with taking ethics and compliance seriously. For many organizations out there that might have a lot of non-legal risks and compliance issues that they're trying to grapple with, I'm not quite sure how putting more lawyers into that situation helps as much as I do like lawyers. But um, I don't know. That I mean, just like I said, without having read the article, re- hearing what you are describing, like that all sounds like great if your organization – what believes that compliance should be subordinate to legal just because it should be and because legal is better and more powerful. Um, There are going to be more and more compliance issues where eventually the wiser move is to have ethics and compliance be co-equal to legal rather than subordinate to it. And that's that's my piece. Um, Just one comment in response to yours, Matt. To me, it misses the fundamental point. There are certain behaviors or decisions that can be legal that legal could say, yes, you're not going to violate the law. But what we're seeing now more is that codes of conduct and ethical principles and values that companies apply are and instill in people are going to um, nonetheless prohibit a course of conduct, even though it may be legal, but it's contrary to the company's values. And it seems to me like once you put Once you merge those two concepts in one organization, you're basically saying, hey, so long as it's legal, let's do it. And that 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 breaks out a whole whole lot of issues to me that should be considered. I would say that, you know, when people say if it's legal, therefore we can do it. Like the implicit point there is that your only stakeholder outside the company worth paying attention to is the regulator because they're the only one who's going to drop the hammer if it's not even if it is legal. There are so or legal or not legal. There are so many other stakeholders now who have very loud voices that do not care if an action is legal. They will still find it offensive and then exact some sort of penalty from the company, whether that's a social right. media campaign or a boycott or anything else. And what good is the legal department going to do you then if you've got consumers burning your reputation down on Twitter? You know, the general counsel isn't going to bail you out of that. Right. And that's my point. The reputational damage. I mean, has become in today's world much more significant than, uh, you know, legal damages in this sense, because your company can be blitzkrieged 
within the course of 48 hours through something that has nothing to do with a legal uh, decision or not, but whatever your corporate values may be, whatever, or some course of conduct. I, so I think it, it kind of, to me, it was an article that's a throwback to the debate 20 years ago that I thought we had resolved, you know, in the last, you know, about 10 years ago. But I guess what he's trying to say is, you know, those, the old days were the better days. Sarah Haddon. What is on your mind? Well, I had in mind that I was going to talk about HR and compliance this morning, but I got derailed, as sometimes happens. I got an email really early this morning from a CCI reader who had found a broken link on the site, and the link happened to be to that ebook that I published for you guys back um, in early, early 2017. It was the book called Trump and Compliance, and it was all about this group's predictions for what would happen after the election. And I couldn't help myself. After I fixed that link, I sat down and I, I downloaded the book and I read the whole thing cover to cover with my coffee in one sitting. And I just had such a good time looking at what you guys said back then that I wanted to revisit that book and share with you some of the things that you said a couple of years ago. So let me just let me just dive right in. And um, I would love for you to give me your, your feedback as well. Okay, Trump and compliance. The intro says the election of Donald Trump has caused us all to wonder and worry about what the future may hold for compliance professionals. When we all woke up to a new world on November the 9th, 2016, Tom Fox responded by asking leading compliance commentators what they think FCPA enforcement and compliance generally might look like under the new administration. Uh, so if I may, Tom, you said, among many other things, that Donald Trump has gone on the record as saying that FCPA is a horrible law and it should be changed and that it puts U.S. businesses at a huge disadvantage. Yet even Trump realized the insidiousness of bribery and corruption in the international business context as, in the same interview, he said that other countries should clean up the corruption that occurs in their countries. While I doubt that businessman Trump understood the link between terrorism and corruption, I am certain that President Trump will either learn about this link very quickly or will be told multiple times by his security advisors. With his emphasis on U.S. security from terrorism, the Trump administration will not want to be seen as softening the war on terrorism, but even making things easier for the bad guys. And after making a number of excellent points, you conclude with, and finally, there's optics. It's unlikely that Mr. Trump would want to be seen as going soft on corruption. And then moving on to chapter two, Matt, it was so enjoyable reading your chapter this morning because you have such a deep and thorough grasp of issues. Um, and in your usual wordsmithy way, you very deftly described the state of various pieces of legislation that were hanging in the, the balance at the time. And I won't share your whole outline or all of your bullet points here, but I do want to share a comment that you made about who the new SEC chair might turn out to be. You say, honestly, nobody outside Trump circles has any idea. The next chairman needs to deal with Trump on the executive side and the liberal firebrand Senator Elizabeth Warren on the Senate side. I can't imagine anyone with the temperament to handle both people on a regular basis. I can't imagine that anyone intelligent enough to run the SEC would actually want the job under those circumstances. And you make two other predictions that were fun to read this morning. You say, we might also tumble into recession thanks to the sharp market turmoil that we'll see this week and the fact that companies across America are tapping the brakes on business plans while they wait to see what the administration does. And then will come the inevitable foreign policy crisis as leaders everywhere try to push Trump to see what they can get away with. And then next up, Michael, you echoed Tom's sentiments when you said the likelihood of any serious dip in FCPA enforcement is remote. And you also urged compliance professionals to keep an eye on civil antitrust enforcement. And you said, quote, traditionally, Republican administrations have reduced civil antitrust enforcement especially in merger reviews. Rather, Republican administrations continue and sometimes increase criminal cartel enforcement. The new administration may face an interesting issue with the DOJ's enforcement regime. Rather, will the DOJ's enforcement regime match the candidate's rhetoric? Or will the Republican approach lead to the typical reduction in civil antitrust enforcement? 
And you conclude with, there are many other areas to watch as well, and it will be an interesting transfer of power, to say the least. Next chapter is J, and you kick off your chapter with the immortal words of The Clash. Darling, you've got to let me know, should I stay or should I go? And then you share this quote from then Secretary of State John Kerry. Bribery, fraud, other forms of venality endanger everything that we hold dear, everything that you value. They feed organized crime. They gnaw away at nation states. They take away the legitimacy of a nation state, and they contribute to human trafficking. They discourage honest and accountable investment and undermine entire communities. And Jay, you later conclude with, we need to make sure that we do not throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. While the Republican Party has traditionally adopted an anti-government, anti-regulatory stance, not all regulation is bad. So we must answer the clash's question in the positive that FCPA, Sox, and Dodd-Frank certainly must stay. And finally, Jonathan, your segment took a stroll through foreign policy concerns, and it touched also on climate, as you noted, quote, a feature of the election has been a possible review of America's relations with Russia. This could have implications for the U.S. sanctions regime. Again, however, there are some inconsistencies. On October 4th, 2016, President Trump, excuse me, President-elect Trump said that Mrs. Clinton's close ties to Putin deserve scrutiny. He has also made allegations of connections between people in the Clinton camp and President Putin. If there is to be a thawing of relations with Russia, a review of the sanctions regime could be one way of signaling a desire to move on from the past. And clearly, it's very early to be making predictions as to how the world of global compliance will change. Other election statements, like the lack of evidence of climate change, could drive additional policy changes. It would be fair to say, however, that the new administration is likely to be less predictable than the previous. And that in (laughs) itself, (laughs) that in itself means organizations are going to have to invest a little more compliance awareness and planning time. So that's where we left things in 2017. And the, the subtitle of this book, title is Trump and Compliance. Subtitle is This Conversation is Just Getting Started. And wow, are we right about that. So don't know what y'all think about it, but just really, really delighted to share that blast from the past. You know, I, I will be the first to admit that, okay, I predicted there might be foreign policy crises. I did not uh, have Turkey on my list as a big <laughs> foreign policy crisis that would push the president around. But no, actually, what I am struck by today that none of us apparently mentioned then, uh, unbelievable number of examples that President Trump has given us on poor leadership poor corporate culture, poor management. Um, You know, Tom, how many discussions, uh, podcasts, posts have you and I done over the last two years looking at something he did that provides fantastic examples for corporate America of don't do it this way, whether that is rooting out a whistleblower to retaliate against him or poor leadership that chases good people away or mishandling of any number of things. Like he is a walking counter example of how not to run a large organization. He's an endless font of wisdom. If you just take the photo <laughs> negative of whatever he's doing. Um, well, and I have to admit, I did not think that would be the big thing. Is, isn't that the whole case though, Matt, uh, that it's an extension of Trump's public service mission to tell people, about entrepreneurial spirit. And it started with The Apprentice, where we learn by example, i.e. bad example, here's how not to run a corporation. And now he's showing us how not to run an administration. This is this is laudable. We're learning by other people's mistakes rather than our own. I do recall that sometime after we published this ebook in 2017. A couple of months after that, I think in May, I had a post uh, right after Bob Mueller was announced as special counsel and said, eventually, Donald Trump will be impeached. And I am glad to see that uh, that prediction seems to be coming to fruition. Wow. Indeed. Well, it was it was great fun to be reminded this morning that readers and listeners and followers still look to you guys for insightful commentary on the administration. And Matt, as you noticed, we are not going to run out of material. Uh, so what I guess all of that means is that we need to dedicate an episode or two to where we are with Trump and compliance over the next uh, few weeks, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do it. Jay Rosen, 
What is on your mind? Thanks, Tom. Uh, this week, uh, when this podcast airs, uh, I will be starting a new five-part blog series on Corporate Compliance Insight, which is Sarah's wonderful website. And I'm going to be looking at, in these five parts, how to assess ethics and compliance in a merger and acquisition context. And part one of this series, I'm going to look at the whys, the what's, and how's of an independent assessment of a target. Many issues in the M&A context are driven by the target or the acquired company and are usually due to the acquiring um, entity not paying close enough attention during this pre-acquisition phase and thus discovering issues during post-closing. The issue is one of the reasons why the Department of Justice has put such an important stock in pre-acquisition phase where a company needs to perform compliance due diligence and a risk assessment which will inform the entire process. A company should begin by asking the target company to provide indicia of best practices compliance programs. Does the company have a code of conduct, appropriate policies and procedures and controls, and what do they look like? Some of the baseline policies you might expect to find, such as anti-retaliation policies, anti-harassment policies, and most importantly, anti-corruption policies which have been implemented. Moreover, have they been effectively implemented? You should next turn to the less structural and more cultural issues to test the culture of the target. Try to determine the culture of the company and whether their company has been committed to creating an ethical and compliant culture. A good proxy for testing anti-corruption posture is to review the target sales model. Is it internal with their own sales employees or do they use third parties and agents and representatives of distributors? It is third parties you need to perform as much review of the target's files on their third party as possible. Next, I'm going to switch, switch the lens to taking a look at the impact on the parties. Starting with the inherent risk in the entire M&A process, surprisingly, a company's ethical and cultural perspective is not often considered. While most investment bankers and attorneys are anxious to get the deal over, the finishing line and collect their fees, companies may be making a big mistake by not doing so. During the pre-acquisition phase, it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel to perform ethics, cultural and compliance due diligence. Some of these resources are already performing due diligence for other parts of the deal. It's not always a question of a brand new set of considerations. It's sometimes a question of integrating these considerations and educating the acquiring company as to what they should be looking for. One of the biggest risks around is ethical culture and fit. The lack of knowledge on each party's culture can lead to many problems in the post-acquisition phase. The key is not to only come with a plan, but to listen and be attentive while implementing that plan. Even after closing, an independent integrity monitor can be useful and to come in and help smooth out the process. That takes us to part three when we look at the plan. First, you should start with the DOJ and the information contained in various resolution documents for the past several years. These issued documents from the DOJ stress that an acquiring entity apply or ascertain that its code of conduct, policies, and procedures regarding corruption are consistent with the acquired company's policies and procedures. All these requirements were clarified in the 2017 Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Programs and its 2009 update, which laid out the following manner to think through these issues. Looking at due diligence, was the misconduct or risk of misconduct identified during diligence? Who conducted the risk review for the acquired merge entities and how was it done? What has been the M&A due diligence process generally? Next, we turn to integration in the M&A process. How has the compliance function been integrated into the merger acquisition and integration process? And lastly, taking a look at the process connecting due diligence to implementation. What has been the company's process for tracking and remediating misconduct or misconduct risks identified during due diligence? These issues demonstrate that there is a continuum from pre-acquisition into post-closing that they build on the prior steps. From the pre-acquisition phase, you should be in a position to develop your post-closing plan. The documentation component is crucial. If no plan is followed, it's extremely hard to demonstrate the pre- and post-acquisition due diligence to an external entity like the DOJ. 
The real issue has to do more with how to demonstrate to a regulator that you have done everything that you can do as a company to identify risks associated with corruption and misconduct. And then if you do identify the misconduct, that you have taken the right steps to inform the government and make the disclosure. Finally, I consider how and why an independent monitor may be useful in this process. One of the ways that affiliated monitors have seen it work extremely well is to have an independent third party help allay some of the concerns around an acquisition. If a company uses an independent resource to do a proactive assessment, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after the uh, acquisition has taken place, such a third party can come in, conduct the same type or similar kind of assessment as you would do under a government requirement. This process allows a determination of whether there has in fact been full integration, whether employees now understand their responsibilities and are comfortable reporting issues to their new managers under the new company structure. Going to part four and taking a look at the oversight of the merged entities, uh, we want to determine if a company has adequately considered ethics and compliance during the M&A process. There are two distinct phases during this process, pre and post acquisition. What we would expect to see in the integration phase, phase is the type of culture which exists through working with respective forces to understand what the combined entity's culture will be. Are these individual cultures compatible in terms of bringing together a program to promote ethics and compliance? This requires, in many cases, deep dives, particularly the use of focus groups, to interact with the workforce to get a true understanding of what some of the cultural elements that are in play. And in many cases, this is just a critical and complicated process. From there, we would move into the controls area to literally put an independent set of eyes on the internal compliance controls. This brings up two interesting observations. The first is the unintended consequences of rapid growth, not taking the time to digest and integrate, leaving a gap or lack of understanding of what was expected from the workforce. The second is the problem of completely unforeseen events. The first area of focus is on the unintended consequences of rapid growth. Many times we've seen companies, particularly smaller ones, that have tried to grow very rapidly through acquisition and mergers. In doing so, the focus was always on the finance and never really concentrated on the people or the human side. The second issue is the pop-up problem, which is something even with reasonably effective diligence that parties missed. Now you are months down the road, post-transaction, perhaps even years down the road and a law school suit pops up. If management is disengaged from compliance and ethics and is 100% focused on revenue and finances, this is a problem which needs to be addressed. In closing out the series, we'll take a look at how an M&A process can benefit from the use of an independent assessment monitor. Um, basically, the best time to engage an independent monitor for the M&A process is as early as practicable. By doing so, there can be a preliminary discussion with senior management about the process, sometimes at the CEO level or with the CFO. From these initial meetings, an independent monitor could be part of the acquirer's team assembled, assembled for the project. We find that people have an easier time of opening up. They seem to be more forthcoming when someone from outside the company comes in and asks questions in a non-threatening manner. The independent monitor is just looking for facts. We find that we can learn more information than we would otherwise get if we were not an independent third party. So now, I know I've said final a few times, but this really is the final question of the series. What should you do if you find an FCPA or other violation that arrives despite your robust pre-acquisition due diligence? The safe harbor for M&A emphasizes how powerful a tool an independent monitor can be in the M&A context. The DOJ certainly sees this as a good practice to have a third party independent involved on both the company side and the reporting side. If required, all of this lends credibility to your ethics and compliance program. Recent guidance from the DOJ, SEC, and other regulators stress that it is vital to assess, assess the culture of your ethics and compliance program, especially if you discover financial irregularities. I hope that you've enjoyed this preview, and uh, you will follow this uh, series next month when it starts on Corporate Compliance Insights.
So now we're going to move on to rants and shout outs, and I'm going to reserve one for myself at the end, but we're going to go back across the Atlantic and see what uh, Mr. Armstrong might have for us. Yeah, I've got um, a sort of shout out and a sort of public service announcement at the same time. And this is the story of uh, Jemima Kelly, who's a journalist over uh, in the UK. And she had an iPhone. Now, many of us does. And she used Apple Pay to get on a bus in London, which you can now do. And we're all millennials on the call, so we know how to do that. But when she was on the bus, her battery died and she'd forgotten her backup charger. Now, a bus inspector then came on the bus and asked her to prove that she'd paid the $2 or so to get on the bus. But because she didn't have the battery, she couldn't prove she had. Now, various set of circumstances involving her moving house, et cetera, et cetera, and she then finds out that she has a criminal conviction for failure to prove that she'd paid for the bus fare. And it gets worse. Because she's got a criminal conviction, she's meant to travel to the US for work, but her visa is declined because she's a criminal. And I I just thought it was a a moderately interesting story that references people, if we're using Apple Pay or some other millennial type thing, charge your device. Because if it doesn't, then you could end up with a criminal conviction and you might end up losing your job. One might even say document, document, document. Wow, Matt Kelly. Uh, yeah, I have a shout out today. Actually, probably a dual shout out and a rant. But my, the shout out first, uh, this is to Inez Cantor, who is a forward for the Boston Celtics, who is Turkish. And unlike the rest of the NBA, which seems to be eager to roll over and count out to the Chinese government, um, Inez Cantor is an unabashed critic of Turkish President uh, Recep Erdogan. And uh, to the point that Turkish authorities have indicted uh, Inez Cantor um, on allegedly charges of belonging to an armed terrorist group, Uh, I personally do not believe that, and I can confirm that the Celtics are nowhere near as dangerous as an armed terrorist group or pretty much anything else these days. Um, But Inez Cantor is definitely standing up for what he believes. He is an unabashed critic of President Erdogan, who is a thug. Um, And he even said, uh, tweeted uh, earlier this week, this is a price I am ready to pay if this is what it takes to stand up for what I believe is right. It is worth it, which is far better than uh, whatever the NBA might be saying. I have a somewhat personal interest in this because not only is he a member of the Celtics and I am from Boston, but um, Inez Cantor, when he is in town and prays on Fridays, he prays at a mosque that is not two blocks from my house where pro Erdogan Turkish supporters have now started showing up at Friday prayers to heckle him. And he has since taken to pulling out his iPhone, which he does keep fully charged, John, <laughs> uh, and recording them, recording the protests. And he respectfully but clearly um, tells them that he is not taking any of their guff. And uh, this has been posted, and it is a somewhat big deal in Boston and probably in Turkish activist circles. But uh, big shout out to Inez Cantor for standing his ground for uh, what he believes are democratic values. And uh, I would stand with him. Um, as opposed to the rest of the NBA, which seems to be ready to roll over for the Chinese government or at best just shut up. Um, so that is the, the rant I have for the rest of professional basketball right now. Michael Volkov. Uh, well, I have a shout out for um, us in the blogosphere uh, for Matthew Stevenson, a global anti-corruption blog, and hopefully uh, everyone reads it. It's a great blog. Uh, and in particular, uh, Matt Uh, does a great job of sort of tracking the administration's conflicts of interest, which is a Herculean task, uh, to say the least. But he had a great post on October 11th where he highlighted uh, 
our president's uh, conflicts of interest with regard to Turkey. Uh, and he noted uh, that uh, Donald Trump has extensive business interests in Turkey, including a Trump Tower in Istanbul, which we all know about. But even back in December 2015, he was quoted as saying, I have a little conflict of interest in Turkey because I have a major, major building in Istanbul. Uh, and indeed, the Trump Towers Istanbul, which the Turkish conglomerate Dogan Holding developed and pays licensing fees to the Trump organization. Um, and uh, there are credible reports that the Erdogan administration believes that this that they have an ability to put pressure on Trump's business partner in Turkey, and it gave them essentially the ability to blackmail the president. So let that sink in for a moment is what uh, Matt says. In addition, uh, entities close to the Turkish government have gotten into the habit of spending heavily at Trump properties in the U.S. The American Turkish Council, Turkey U.S. Business Council have held multiple events at the Trump Hotel in, uh, in D.C. Just uh, some interesting ideas as we sort of struggle with what's going on in Turkey these days and in the Middle East. So uh, shout out to Matt. It's a great blog. People should definitely track it. Sarah Haddon. I just have a, a very brief shout out this morning. Um, I've had the privilege lately of making contact with and developing some some new author relationships with some people who are new to careers in compliance. They're, they're young and they're, they're new to the field and they come from varied backgrounds. And they're going to be participating in a, um, the rollout of a new section on the site that's devoted to early career compliance concerns. And as I say, they have very various backgrounds, but I think they will all bring a bright, young, fresh, new perspective to the conversation and maybe a, maybe a welcome dose of idealism along the way. We'll see. So anyway, shout out to shout out to all those who are who are new and I look forward to talking about that more in the future. Jay Rosen. Uh, so last night they showed on the news uh, footage from the Alfred E. Smith Memorial Foundation, which is a charity in New York City that raises funds uh, for the Catholic Chalice charities and the Archdiocese of New York. Now, first of all, I was confused because I thought I had read the Alfred E. Newman Memorial instead of <laughs> Alfred E. Smith. So after I dispelled that of my notion, I saw that there were some remarks made by uh, the former uh, Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, and he says, um, Ma uh, Donald Trump recently demeaned me as the world's most overrated general during a contentious White House meeting with members of Congress. Mattis goes on to say, I'm not just an overrated general. In fact, I'm the most overrated general. And I'm honored to be considered that by Donald Trump because he also called Meryl Streep an overrated actress. So I guess I'm the Meryl Streep of generals. And frankly, <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. So uh, I always love the pithy <laughs> comment. Nice. And uh, there was a reason... Uh, Secretary Mathis and other members in the military did not want to speak ill of the president, but we are careening uh, closely into the guardrails and maybe even going off the edge. So uh, I hope there will be other like-minded members of the military and the government who will finally uh, step up. And I just want to say, what took you so long, Mad Dog? So and I'm going to exercise uh, my executive moderator role to uh, rant. And that rant is going to be the Mick Mulvaney press conference yesterday. Of everything I have seen and heard from the Trump administration, perhaps that was the most surreal experience that we have had since Trump became president. Uh, the acting chief of staff, uh, without apparently without irony uh, and with a certainly straight face, uh, said that well, of course, there was a quid pro quo when President Trump called the president of Ukraine. That's called politics. Uh, apparently, he didn't read the felony criminal laws of the United States, where uh, extortion is indeed a um, – that was only the beginning, though. Because then he announced, once again with no irony and with a, with a very straight face, that the G7 summit uh, next year in June of 2020 will be held at uh, Donald Trump's property, the Doral Resort. 
Now, in June, the uh, average occupancy rate of the Corral is about at 30 percent. So uh, one might think this is a way to bump up occupancy. But um, his excuse of why this was not a conflict of interest and indeed did not does not violate the emoluments clause of the Constitution was that uh, Doral was doing this at cost so that there would be no profit <laughs> for the Trump administration. Uh, apparently, in, in addition to not reading uh, U.S. criminal law, he hasn't read the U.S. Constitution because the emoluments clause does not have a profitability subclause in it. Truly one of the most surreal experiences I have ever seen in a press conference, and I just cannot believe how corrupt not only the president is, but the entire administration. Whatever I did or didn't write in uh, November of um, 2016, after Trump became was elected president, and Sarah talked about uh, in her section, uh, even I couldn't believe things have uh, degenerated to where they are now. So um, on that cheery note, uh, thanks everyone, and I greatly look forward to the next time we all get together. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance. I hope you'll join us for our next episode where we're going to take up our continuing conversation on the Trump administration compliance. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio.